mission is to pull families together in Lower Slobovia one slice at a time with our affordable, nutrient-dense, whole wheat slobber bread. Alrighty guys, so my name is Kelsey White and I'm the CEO of Slobber Bread. And you know, my primary goal as CEO of the company, as I'm sure any other CEO would agree, is essentially just to hire people that are smarter than I am. And so uh, with that, I'm gonna let the rest of the executive team introduce themselves to you and tell you their role within the company. Good morning, my name is Oscar Weisensee. I am the Chief Financial Officer of the company. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrea Gurney, the Chief Economist. I'm Kelsey Josek, the VP of Marketing. Uh, Brent Simrock, Vice President of Production. I'm Chandler Cowan, I'm the Economic Analyst. Victoria Fife, I'm the Accountant. Tegan Baldry, Supply Chain Manager. Ali Spears, I'm the Brand Manager. Okay, let me give you guys a little introduction into slobber bread. Um, first and foremost, it is a whole grain bre uh, bread in loaf, um, and we are an inferior good and in perfect competition. Um, how it works is that we contract with farmers for their wheat. Uh, we have requirements that it's non-GMO and only has slob grades one and two. Um, we process everything in-house, everything from once the wheat comes in, to baking, to packaging, to distributing. Um, that's an example, going back, that's an example of our market, uh, 227.5 million one pound loaves a year, and that requires 2.53 million bushels of wheat in order to do that. Um, and then once we're done with everything, we sell to local grocery stores. Um, over here is an example of our market linkages. Uh, there is no import and export, so all we really have are the beginning wheat stock and then any wheat that comes in from the farmers. Um, and then all our demand just comes straight from bread demand from within the country. Um, and this is just a simple supply chain. It just goes from seed distributors to the wheat farmers. Um, like I said, we contract with the wheat farmers. So we produce and then we go to local grocery stores, which then goes straight to the consumer. <coughs> Okay, a quick SWOT analysis of our company. Our strengths are obviously we believe in our marketing plan, our ability to reach the cu customers and give them what they need, our affordability um, of our product, and the fact that it's healthy. We talked about it's whole wheat, and we take the highest grade of the wheat that we have in Slovenia. Um, we specialize very well in our product and we get to market very well. We do have weaknesses such as limited selection of products that we sell, and we just focus on the bread and get that out to market. Um, our brand recognition, we're gonna have to build that up because we're a small company getting going in the Slovovian economy. Um, not established in the marketplace yet, it kind of goes along with that. We have an inexperienced executive team, you know, we're all young uh, coming out of college, but we can figure that out because we're Aggies, obviously. So, um, opportunities, we have the ability to capitalize on low income because of that affordability, and the ability to capture market share because we believe in our product's ability to do so. And the threats is obviously uncertain crop yields, that being the nature of having an ag product, especially with wheat. And then expansionary economic policies could hurt us because of the fact we're an inferior good. And then we're obviously price takers as well. So we have to be able to market the exact numbers to that. So our capital investment into our facility and equipment. Uh, for the four year time span of the model, we decided to lease out a 135 foot square foot facility. Uh, and within that, we plan on moving in 10 flour sifters, 10 dough mixtures, 10 dough scales. And since we're trying to produce 18,200 loaves a day, uh, we split the loaf, loaf pans in half, so each pan can be used twice at 9,100 loaf pans, 20 bread ovens, 10 bread slicers, and 10 bread trucks to disperse it out through the country. Um, and then the remaining of our 300,000 uh, capital expenditures with 28,901, uh, we plan on investing that, in renovating the building, doing some hard wiring, uh, building a <coughs> sanitary sanitation facility and stuff like that to maintenance our equipment. So for our startup cash position, we decided since our executive team is um, about to be newly graduated from college, we are broke college students at the moment just trying to pay our rent and feed ourselves daily, um, but we wanted to engage in our entrepreneurial spirit, so we decided that we would each invest $5,000 in order to get us to $45,000 as our initial investment, investment and um, cost position. All right, so our marketing plan, obviously our product is slobber bread. It's non-GMO, whole wheat bread that is nutrient-dense and very good for you. 
Uh, it's really self-explanatory there. Our price, we decided to set about $1.80. Uh, for this, we looked at the HEV equivalent in Lower Sobolbia called SOV. Uh, they make their, uh, make their bread locally as well, and they price theirs at $1.84. So we wanted to use a penetration pricing strategy and price it a bit lower than that. Uh, for our placement within the stores, obviously, we're going to be in the grocery store bread aisle. Uh, we wanted to be eye level and on end caps. That way, it's one of the first things you see. And for promotion, since 90% of uh, lower civilians uh, have TVs, we decided to run about 30 second TV commercials um, with a catchy little jingle on it to get stuck in your head and you won't be able to get it out the rest of the day. And then we'll have newspaper ads since tonight, uh, since 50% of slobs also read the newspaper, we'll write some ads in there as well. Of course, then we have our celebrity endorsement, Ricky Slobby. He drives our car for us. He does an excellent job in our commercials. Um, and you may have seen him before, but he does an excellent job. Uh, we like working with him very much so. And then our packaging, obviously, uh, we're using bright colors. Our primary color is yellow, uh, red, and blue against a white background. It's also a lot of stand out, especially in the bread aisle, where it's a lot of warm, neutral colors that don't really stand out to you. Uh, so that is our marketing plan. All right, guys, um, I'm gonna go over the elasticity assumption and the market share assumption. And what we have to demonstrate the elasticity assumptions is this chart over here. And essentially what it is is just a snapshot, a snapshot, snapshot of depositions of both income and own price elasticities. Um, and what these yellow uh, highlighted boxes demonstrate is where slobber bread falls within both of those categories. Um, so you can see that since our income elasticity is negative 0 0.70, that implies that we are an inferior good, which means that as incomes are rising, people are going to consume less and less of our good. Um, our own price elasticity is negative 0.20. Um, which implies that the demand for our good is inelastic, which means that it's not very sensitive to changes in price. Now taking a look at the market share, um, it can be assumed that since we are a new company, you know, we're not gonna be able to come into the market as a dominant force. And the fact that we do have competitors like SOB, um, we, so with taking those two, two factors into consideration, we assumed a 2% market share, which means that we're gonna be producing 4.55 million loaves of bread per year. And we got that number by multiplying the market quantity, 227.5 million loaves of bread, by that 2% to get 455, or 4.55 million loaves of bread per year. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and look at different scenarios that could impact slobber bread. So initially we start off with the baseline as follows. Uh, going forward, you'll see that the total reserves and the reserve requirement ratio are going to act as monetary policy tools for expansionary contractionary policy. At the same time, uh, we know that government spending and the marginal tax rate are going to serve as tools for fiscal policy. Now based on these baseline values, we were able to generate a general equilibrium in lower suburbia. In this general equilibrium, the interest rate is 3.48% and the real GDP is 1,320. So what this represents, these are the interest in the real GDP that satisfies both the product and the money market. The product market is represented by the downward sloping IS curve and the LM or money market is represented by the upward sloping line. Now, as we go ahead and we take a look at the different shocks that are going to occur in our economy, it's important to keep in mind the impacts that those will have on Slobber Red's big five variables. Now, we know that in Lower Slobobia, we have no inflation. In addition, it is a closed economy. So at this point, we don't really need to worry about the inflation or the exchange rate. However, when it comes to interest rate, that is going to impact us directly. So as, for example, as interest rate increases, we know that that will increase our interest expenses, thus having a negative impact on our net income and vice versa. As for unemployment, for example, if the unemployment rate increases, this is telling us that the demand for labor has dropped and the wage rate has dropped as well. As a result, lowering some of our input costs. And finally, when we look at growth in GDP, this represents consumer disposable income. Since we are inferior good, as consumer disposable income increases, it's actually going to reduce the demand for slobber bread. Now we'll go ahead and take a look at our baseline macro to market to micro. When we look at the macro market, we have an equilibrium in the aggregate product market. 
Since there's no inflation, you can see that we are operating in that Keynesian range. In addition, we are representing a recessionary <coughs> gap. Now we move over to the Sublovian red market. Here we have an equilibrium quantity of 227.5 million, which is what we got earlier as we explained um, in Lower Slovakia, uh, each person consumes a 65 loaves of bread a day, uh, a year. And we also have an equilibrium price of $1.80. This price then is transferred over to the slobber, to slobber bread. We can see that we are making a profit here, which is going to be the difference of the marginal cost and average cost times quantity. Now it is important to note, since we are a startup company, our uh, pre-tax profit margin is actually going to be a little lower. It will fall in the red, so it'll take us about four years to become established. Okay, right, so I'm gonna give y'all a quick run through um, on the expansionary policy scenario. And what this graph is demonstrating is just how these left hand, left uh, hand variables are impacted as a result of expansionary policy. Um, these arrows are just showing the general direction that each of these variables moves. Um, I'll go into further detail on each of these variables um, in the last slide. Um, and what this is, is just a graphical representation of the general equilibrium in Lower Slobovia. Um, you can see as a result of expansionary policy, both the IS and LM curves shifted to the right, um, resulting in a lower interest rate and an increase in real GDP. And as Andrea was saying earlier, um, these big five variables are variables that have a direct linkage from the food fiber system to the general economy. And so you can see as a result of expansionary policy, um, we know that we're in the Keynesian, in the Keynesian range, so, so there's no change in inflation, um, interest decreased, unemployment decreased, and the growth in GDP increased as a result of expansionary policy. Now lastly, I'm gonna walk you through the macro to market to micro linkage for expansionary policy. And now the primary goal of expansionary policy is to reduce or minimize the gap between how do you flip this? Y-E and Y-F-E. And now just a show of hands, how many of y'all are graduating in May? Awesome. So another way to look at it is Y-E is where we are right now and Y-F-E is graduation. So in essence, we're gonna do whatever it takes to get to that point, right? Right? It's the same thing for the economy. Now there's two ways that the economy can do this. Two ways through, ma uh, through monetary policy is to increase the amount of total reserves or decrease the reserve requirement ratio. Each of these actions will increase the money supply, which will lower interest rates, increase consumption expenditures, thus increasing <coughs> aggregate demand in the aggregate product market. Another way to achieve this is through fiscal policy, through increasing the level of government spending, which has a direct impact on aggregate demand. So in essence, if you increase government spending, you're also going to increase aggregate demand. So either one of those actions will result in increasing the aggregate demand and the aggregate product market. Now linking this to the Slobovian bread market, um, since we mentioned that our good is an inferior good, as a result of the rising incomes and the aggregate product market, it can be assumed that the demand for our product will fall, thus decreasing the price and decreasing the quantity. Now once again, linking this to slobber bread, um, since we are in a perfectly competitive market, we have to accept whatever price the market dictates. And so since the price and quantity decreased in the Slobovian bread market, it can also be assumed that the price and quantity will decrease for slobber bread. So in conclusion, it can be assumed that our total revenue will decrease under expansionary policy as a result of the decreased price and the decreased quantity. So next we ran a contractionary policy scenario. And in this scenario, um, we decreased our total reserves from 120 to 85, but we actually kept our fractional reserve requirement ratio the same at 0.22. So that means that in order to change our total reserves, we had to sell government bonds and we had to raise the discount rate. And so um, those are both monetary policy actions that we took. Um, as far as fiscal policy actions that we took, government spending, we decreased from 200 to 190, and we raised the marginal tax rate from 15% to 22%. Um, autonomous taxes remain the same at 10. So this is the general equilibrium. And as you can see, both the IS and LM curves shifted to the left from the blue uh, baseline to the red um, scenario that we ran. So as you can see, both the interest or the interest rate went up and the real GDP is actually lower. 
So how did this affect the big five variables? Well, inflation, again, we didn't account for it because we're still in the Keynesian range. Um, the interest rate, as I said on the previous slide, increased from 3.48 to 4.2%. Unemployment rate increased slightly from 13.91 to 13.98. And the growth in GDP, we actually had a reduction from 13.20 to 10.59. Um, again, foreign exchange we didn't account for because we are a closed economy. So macro, the market, the micro. In the aggregate product market, because of the contractionary policy that we took, um, we had a shift to the left, meaning that we increased aggregate demand. Um, in the suburban bread market, we actually had an opposite shift. So we shifted to the right, and that's because we are an inferior good, but it went the opposite direction. Um, this shift resulted in an increase an increase in price and an increase in quantity because we moved from PBE to, or PBE to PB1 and QBE to QB2. So because again, we are price takers, this shifted over to our micro graph and the increased price, we also had an increased quantity, meaning that contractionary policy was a positive for swap of bed. Um, real quickly, I just wanted to go over the financial indicators that we have from this. Um, as you can see from the liquidity, it's an increasing slope, which is what we want to see. Uh, you never want to see liquidity or the um, ratio there to be lower than one, uh, which it does work out except for expansionary policy in 2018. Um, solvency uh, is a downward slope, which is what you also want to see. Uh, the debt ratio shouldn't be above 0.5, but we do get that in 2018. Uh, afterwards, though, we are below that, uh, except for expansionary again in 2019. Um, and then debt coverage and profitability are both uh, increasing throughout. But the one thing that you can see is that uh, through all the graphs, contractionary policies help us and expansionary policies hurt us. Okay, speaking about risk, uh, the company has a required rate of return of 11.48%. That will be the sum of a risk neutral, which is the interest rate of the country, plus a business risk that takes into consideration risk associated with price of bread of the industry, cost of the inputs, and their productivity. We also have to add a financial risk premium, which takes into account the leverage ratio of the company, that is the relationship of debt to equity. We start with this, 11.48%, and after four years, we get to this, 8.48%, not taking into account financial risk because the leverage ratio has decreased and the financial situation of the company has improved. So after conducting the NPV analysis, we came to the conclusion that we would be economically feasible and we'd be, we would be able to cover all the variable and fixed costs. Also, um, through doing the analysis, we found out that because we are an inferior good, um, our initial thought of the expansionary process or expansionary policy being the best fit um, was true and that it would make our more successful. Well, what could go wrong? Uh, obviously, since we're contracting with wheat farmers, the weather can have a big effect on our yield. Uh, we could have floods, like Noah's Ark could happen all over again, or we could go into a drought. Uh, other natural disasters could occur. We could have earthquakes, tornadoes, a zombie apocalypse, who, who knows it. Uh, we also have diseases and pests within the, uh, the wheat fields uh, that can negatively impact our uh, wheat production as well as weeds. Our factory failure, uh, something could happen in our factory and our factory could shut down, maybe it catches fire and it blows up to little bitty bits and we won't make any more bread. Um, then obviously our expansionary policy implications, since we are an inferior good, um, expanding the economy will make the demand for our good fall and return and neg negatively impact our business. And the issue of achieving brand recognition, since we are so new, there's other established bread companies out there, uh, so we'll have to fight for some more brand recognition. And more questions? Okay, questions from the floor first. Somebody need more of the time? Mm -hmm. yeah. so since the own price elasticity was inelastic, do you think that even if demand were to fall, that it would be beneficial for y'all to not change the price because you may not be able to gain as much of the price that you just generated for? Well, 
Well, really, since we are in a perfectly competitive setting, um, we're pretty subject to what happens in the market. You know, we really don't have much say on pricing strategy. I mean, in a sense we do, but um, ultimately we really have to um, follow along the lines of what's happening in the market since we are price takers. Um, so I guess to answer your question, would really just be dependent on what's happening in the economy. You know, as you saw, um, what happens in the aggregate product market impacts what happens for the bread market as a whole, which thus impacts slot <coughs> bread itself. So I guess just having strategies to analyze what's happening in the economy, to maybe think of strategies to combat um, those uh, situations that happen in the economy that will impact our price that we have to take. Uh, in the beginning of the slideshow, y'all said y'all are in perfect competition, but then you just said y'all are perfect competition. So can you clarify that? No, I said we were in perfect yeah, competition. In. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one more. So you have an interior with bread. Mm -hmm. So why are you only focusing on the production of, of bread if you can expand your limit on maybe cooking, uh, baking cookies, crackers, uh, that, that will help you to establish your company sooner, you know? So why, why are you only focusing on the bread production? I think you answered, you answered that yeah. question. Yeah, just, I mean, for right now, when we're trying to establish ourselves in the market, we're gonna stick with that bread, especially since our, um, you know, our focus is on the lower income consumer. Like I said, when the economy expands or our market share expands, it'll be easier for us to test out those avenues. And it kind of comes back to also being a startup business. You know, thinking about it, that would require taking on more loans, which would have mean piling on more debt. You know, why as a startup company would we want to increase our debt standing? Um, so I think that that would be maybe something we would consider, um, you know, maybe in year four, once we saw that our debt to equity was starting to increase, we say, okay, we're decreasing our debt, increasing our equity. Now we can look at ways to maybe expand and increase growth. And we'd also have to restructure our marketing plan with that. Um, so we'd be marketing a bunch of different products, which just goes back to piggy off of what Kelsey was saying, um, more cost. And right now, college students uh, just coming out uh, of undergrad, it's not particularly feasible for us. Okay, I'd like to ask a couple of questions, if I may. Um, Andrea, did I hear you say that uh, GDP represents disposable personal income? Uh, consumer income, real GDP, uh, just going off of like our definition that we had in there, so as GDP increases, um, we do know that consumer in it, disposable income is going to be increasing as well. Um, so think, okay, they are exactly. linked, but Not disposable fair. income is after tax. Yeah. Whereas um, GDP is income. Yeah, okay, yeah. sorry. Um, you, you did <coughs> mention the supply elasticity. Uh, in, in your presentation, you mentioned the, the demand elasticity, but you didn't mention the uh, supply elasticity. Uh, I think that the supply that elasticity that? was 0 0.20. Is, is that important? Uh, yeah, it is. We were assuming a relatively uh, steep supply curve, and um, that was just based on some research that we did in the economy. Okay, that would make price vary more than a Correct. very elastic curve. Okay. Um, Let's see, uh, Kelsey, the VP of marketing. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned the price of 180. Is that a price to the grocery store or is that the in store price? To That's the, the in store price. Okay. So the price <coughs> to the grocery store would actually be a bit lower than that. So you so actually. Have more so your product price is less than a dollar each. Yes. Okay. Or else you have no profit. Yes. Okay. All right, let's give them a hand. Uh, growers in Slobovia of a organic pecan, and we're group two. Hi, I'm Morgan Seal. I'm the CEO of Slow Diamond. <coughs> I'm Tanner Young, president of Slow Diamond. I'm Whitney Conrad. I'm the chief of marketing. Howdy, I'm Claudia Sully, the CFO. Howdy, I'm Sam Rubino. I'm the chief economist. Howdy, I'm Lauren Mintz. I am the VP of production. Howdy, I'm Shelly Second. I'm the chief brand officer. Good morning, I'm Ben Castaño, I'm the Chief Sales Officer. Howdy, I'm Trevor Coots, I'm Operations Manager. So our mission statement is that, is that we are a firm believer in providing high quality pecans that are produced in environment, environmentally friendly conditions and are happy to contribute to a healthy lifestyle for all of our consumers in Slovakia. 
We believe that our farm is in many of our community for the students to treat our employees, customers, and our neighbors like family. We aspire to become a respected member of the Slovakia farming region with the goal of helping, of helping company grow, profitability, <coughs> and being a keystone part of the farm supply chain. So a little bit about our product. Uh, Slow Diamond prides itself in providing a hand-picked raw product that strives to meet the standards of all ethnic and dietary qualifications. Our product is organically grown by local farmers. By creating a sustainable <coughs> farming operation, Slow Diamond will be known as the organic source of pecans in Slovakia for future generations to come. Our raw pecans not only taste amazing, but leaves our clients satisfied knowing they are purchasing from a sustainable farming community committed to perfection. So with the growth of health conscious and environmentally conscious people, uh, consumers, they want to know that their product is made um, without pesticides and the health benefits such as <coughs> monounsaturated fats, which can be good for uh, lowering cholesterol. And they are high in fiber, as well as <coughs> sustainable growth. Okay, so our supply chain is pretty easy to follow. Uh, we're the farm input producer, wholesaler, everything besides a retailer. Uh, this, this keeps us from, being a retailer you have to do smaller packages, more shipping costs. It's, it's just much more hectic. So we're going to sell large uh, large quantities of pecans to different people. Uh, they're, they're shelled. Uh, and you know they can have them from there or chop them up or whatever they please to do with them and sell them individually. You know maybe roast them, put sugar on them, whatever. And then our SWOT analysis, our strengths are uh, organic, locally owned, high quality, and strong market prices. Uh, pecans are not cheap; they're they're really good to eat. And uh, uh, the high quality of ours, you know, like I said, it's organic, and you know we, we take a lot of pride in the pecans that we grow here. Our weaknesses. Uh, a limitation of land, weather, and seasonal production cycle. That being said, if we have bad weather one year, we could have hailstorms that knock pecans out of the trees earlier than they're ready, uh, cause a lot of damage, drought, everything like that. Need a lot of water for the pecans. Um, they do come. They start sprouting in late spring, and then October, November is when they start to fall. So it really helps us out, even though uh, it helps us out because Thanksgiving's in. November and then you know we can mark up our prices possibly for uh, Thanksgiving in November. Uh, opportunities, our ability for market to increase through season, seasonality. I kind of explained that. Developing technology further stretch and maximum production yield. Uh, it seems like every year you know farms and uh, produce starts growing earlier and ending later in higher yields, and uh, that goes along with the threats. We have new competitive firms that are in the market. We're not the biggest out there. So there are other markets that can, uh, you know, lower their price and sell a lot more quant quantity, but we have to be on par. Uh, then market fluctuation through the price. I mean, any any time, whenever the market can go up, go down, and our prices are uh, somewhat unstable in most situations. Okay, because we are a farming corporation, there is a lot of capital equipment that is required to maintain, operate our pecan orchards. Our tractor is used not only to move different debris, different things that can accumulate from um, trees, either breaking down or dying or need to be moved off the property, but it's also used to tow our cart, um, which would we, we use the cart after the tree shaker has shaken the pecans off the individual trees within the orchards. The nuts then, fall, <coughs> then come to the ground and we use a sweeper to sweep them into neat uh, rows that are that are along the lines of the actual orchard. After they are sweeped, we use rakes to rake them up to where an elevator would actually, if you can think of like a conveyor belt, put them onto a storage cart. The storage cart will then be brought to our storage yard, which will house the pecans until they're ready for transport to the individual um, customers that are picking up from us wholesale. And our land is 200 acres with about 30 pecan trees per acre. So out of the 3.5 million in the labor force, 30% um, have internet, 90% um, have television, and 50% read the newspapers. So in 
hard to discuss in the demographic show. So about 63.2% of the population see our advertisements through television and commercials. 16.8% um, see ads on the internet, and 11.6% see um, ads in the newspaper, and then we have billboards and flyers of 9.5%. Um, our unpriced loss this week in RAND is negative 0.7, meaning that it's um, inelastic, so a large change in the price will not change the demand that much. Um, income loss this week is 0.9, meaning that our um, and then our own price loss is the uh, supply is 23, which is also inelastic, which is not very sensitive to price. Um, our market share is pretty low. Um, we have the highest quality for cons in the lowest proportion area, and our market share is in the lowest um, These were our variables that we were given to run our company through. So as you can see in the expansionary, we experienced more monetary um, <coughs> policy changes as with total reserves increasing and our reserve requirement ratio going down, which increases our money multiplier. And the only fiscal tool used was increasing government spending, where in the uh, contractionary, we experienced the opposite with more fiscal policy tools were used as moving, uh, decreasing government spending and increasing the marginal tax rate but the only monetary tool used was decreasing total reserves. Um, this is our baseline scenario with our ISL limit curve and uh, our market equilibrium price, or sorry, <laughs> interest rate is at 4.95% and the real GDP is um, 1,129 and billion for GDP. And the big five are show how it affects our company as a whole. And since there's no inflation, that doesn't affect us, but the rate of interest as a direct determinant of how much we have to borrow from banks and stuff, so we'd have to take out more loans. So that would put off expansion if your interest is really high. Rate of employment directly affects the demand for our product. And um, real GDP is, it's like the growth in GDP. And um, since it's a food and farm industry, most of the time it doesn't really affect us as much since it's usually like an inferior good, but our good is uh, normal, so it'll affect us more. Um, this is our market equilibrium. So using our macro data, these are the points that we got. And our the market equilibrium price is 2648, and the quantity is 484,000. 908, and then the total res or the uh, revenue available for our product is 12,607,608. Okay, so this is a graph of the um, general equilibrium 